Now, now we have to get Go. All right. Welcome again. This is uh, going to kick off here the engineering track of the conference. And uh, I'm going to lay out a technical vision of, I think, where we should go with the product, with the technology. Um, so I'm Oleg Berenboim. This is Jason Fry. Um, he, Jason and I kind of collaborate on a lot of architectural uh, questions. Um, and so that's why we're here together. Um, so the goals of, of uh, the whole project. Um, I think the number one goal is really to become the de facto open source cloud management platform. Um, so that, that's going to mean a bunch of things. That's going you know, to mean um, that we have to be, the software has to be robust enough to have enough features and uh, stability um, to be able to be used uh, in large uh, mission critical environments. The software also has to be um, quite secure because it's running in those environments. And uh, there's going to be a security roadmap uh, given tomorrow, if anybody's interested in that. Um, the other thing is that the second goal is that we sh really should have a vibrant developer community. Um, right now, the contributors are really concentrated in Red Hat. And uh, I think the goal is for that not, not to be that way going forward. Um, with that in mind, uh, there's a cloud broker integration roadmap that's being given tomorrow by Booz Allen. Um, and then the final goal, uh, the last kind of high level goal is to have a vibrant user community um, where the user community can share use cases and share content between each other um, and also start uh, dealing with uh, answering questions or helping other users on forums such as talk.manageq.org or on the ManageIQ IRC channel. Uh, I think those will kind of be the real um, real clarity for me that the community is really starting to come together um, and not really centralized. But the community doesn't really mean right at that. That's really what that's going to mean for me. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so some of the challenges. Um, so I, I think the, the good part is that uh, we put together, Alberto put together a, an excellent framework for the REST API, and uh, hopefully it should be pretty straightforward to extend as we kind of have uh, uh, the need to do so, and I think there will be a lot of need going forward. But I think some of the challenges are that extending the base product today is quite difficult. You need a lot of knowledge of where things are, and how things are, how it's all put together. Um, same thing on the user interface. Extending the user interface is challenging today. Um, it's not quite obvious where to add something to get a new drop down on the screen, to get a new tab on the screen, to get, to get something. Um, and then the other challenge is that uh, even though I talked about um, the technology being on a LARP stack, Linux, Apache, Ruby on Rails, and Postgres. Um, we have a, still a fairly non-standard Rails environment um, that I really think we have to try to standardize so that we can bring Ruby and Rails developers a lot easier into the community. So we'll start focusing on, on each of the areas. So extending the base, what are the challenges there? What, what kind of things are, are not easy to do. Um, Jason, you want to take this one? Sure. So we get a lot of questions all the time, uh, especially on talk or in IRC. How do I add some new provider? How do I add this cloud provider? How do I add a new storage provider? Um, the community really wants to see us moving in the direction of absorbing other projects, or not absorbing them, but uh, integrating with other products. And um, we recently added uh, SCVMM. We got the kind of base functionality for it, and it took a long time. And trying to explain to somebody that turned out to be really, really difficult. Um, there's t dozens of places all over the code that um, uh, provider, just a provider for infrastructure or cloud has to go into, not to mention some of the other things like storage, or things we don't even have, like SDN, uh, software-defined networking. Um, so 
one of the things that we're trying to look at is seeing how we can solve this in a more, um, in a simpler fashion, um, enabling the community to try to be able to extend the product um, for new types of things that we never even thought about before. Yeah, so one of the kind of base extensions that's going to be discussed later on today is the uh, addition of heat and cloud formation, you know, into the, the base of the uh, uh, technology. So the other area that's kind of a challenge for us, as I mentioned, is extending the UI. Uh, how do we add a new content area, a tab, a drop down, just a new area in the UI? Uh, it's not really trivial right now, it's, it's actually in fact quite complicated. Um, you have to know a lot of things about where all the pieces are. You have to have a lot of kind of domain expertise before you can add something simple. Um, in terms of what technologies we choose, I think we have to um, choose technologies that are first of all open source, um, so that we kind of have a path, a clear path going forward, um, and that are consistent and easy to use. Um, styling in the UI. Um, the UI today is uh, not necessarily um, consistent. It doesn't necessarily kind of, um, it's not the same as you go from screen to screen. It, it sometimes looks as if, as if it's a little bit kind of off. And I think we have to get to a better, uh, a more consistent style across the whole UI. Um, the same vein, I think that we have to be, the UI, the UI has to be a bit more responsive in that it has to figure out its um, environment, what screen it's running on, what, what format it's running on, and adapt um, to, to what it's running on. So, um, in other words, it should dynamically start computing where it is, what, what the various areas are, and adjust itself automatically. Um, in the future, we're probably going to have people that will want to run this on iPads and phones and tablets and kind of whatever. Um, I think the UI has to be really kind of responsive to all those different types of environments. That I, I don't even think it's future. I think that's now. Yeah, you know, I, I know yeah. people want it today. We yeah. don't have it today. Yeah. Um, if the community can help us figure out how to get there, that would just be terrific. Um, and then there's uh, the whole aspect of being scalable. Um, it has to be more performant. I know that today in the UI there's a lot of back-end code that does a lot of polling to the server. I think all that kind of has to start going away and the UI has to start becoming more faster. Um, it, it has to just keep snapping back each and every screen, um, especially where there's a little interaction with the database. Um, and, yeah. So, uh, sorry about that. So there's, uh, I think Dan and, and uh, is giving a presentation on the UI directions and roadmap, Dan and the team. Uh, and that should be later today as well. So hopefully we'll start answering some of these questions, or at least uh, questioning. Uh, hi everybody, I'm a provider. So I kind of touched on this a little earlier. Um, the plugin provider architecture, which will be at the end of the day today, I believe, uh, given by Greg. Uh, he'll go into kind of some of the details of that. Um, but the real, um, the real big takeaway from, from this is that there is a lot that goes into adding a new provider. People think it's like, oh, just collect the inventory and you're done. It's like, no, there's inventory, there's events, you have to have some way to collect the events. So, you know, are you going to do a polling type thing or a callback type thing? Every provider is different. Some have REST APIs, some, some have SOAP APIs. Um, there's new components that may have to be added or, or gems added to the application in order to talk to some new provider. Um, capacity and utilization, um, how do we store that in our database and, and making it consistent across all the providers. That's the challenge there because what Manage IQ does is provides that single pane of glass. But in order to do that, we got to figure out how all the little parts fit together in the same buckets. That's extremely challenging. Um, the other really hard part is uh, on the interface, Web UI, if you have some new thing that's never been seen before or you need to present it a little differently, uh, even terminologies. Um, when we added Amazon, all of a sudden we have images and instances in the cloud, and it, that's never what they were called in the past. We started saying VMs and templates, and people have no idea what you're talking about when you talk about that with the cloud. So even presenting things differently per provider uh, is a challenge. Um, and at the back end, in order to actually support all these things, uh, there are different types of workers. You have the role-based access control. Uh, 
Some workers need different roles. Um, for example, in, in our VMware provider, we have uh, what we call the VIM broker. The purpose of that thing is to actually broker all connections to vSphere because vSphere actually only allows a limited number of connections. So if all of our appliances are connecting to vSphere at the same time, you run out of connections and things just don't work. So we have this broker that allows everybody to talk to the broker and that will talk to vSphere for you. But that's a back-end thing. How do you get the system to know that when I have to talk to vSphere, oh, I have to talk to this broker, which means I have to start a process to do that, managing all that. Um, that can get tricky, especially if you start, um, if each one has to do it differently. Uh, configuration, it's shared in the database right now, it's kind of gross, and uh, <laughs> kind of a little better, and, and kind of leveling the thing across uh, providers is something we need to do. So like I said, later today, uh, Greg will be talking about that, and uh, start laying out a roadmap for how we get there. Cool. You know, the other thing that's not on here, um, is uh, VM fleecing kind of needs um, also some sort of pluggability in that each provider exposes um, the way VM fleecing works is, is we kind of look at the raw bits on a piece of storage and then we can drill into kind of any uh, into the file system into whatever into the Windows registry but um, the complicated thing really about integrating a new provider is not the fleecing piece, it's about exposing that, those raw bits to the fleecing uh, technology so that it can read through it. So different platforms expose the, the bits on the storages in different ways, and you have to, have to prepare them in different ways to, to, to be able to be consumed. Um, in general, it's just hard to extend the base functionality. Uh, like, if we want to switch to a different reporting service, there's not one place to go today to say, you know, the report generation that we have in the product, we can use a better one, and you know, we pick one, than the homegrown one that we've put together. But it's not trivial to switch over. There's so many pieces of technology kind of in, in, interconnected. Because of the history of Manage IQ, um, the code was developed in a kind of very fast, aggressive style that was not really uh, meant to be teased apart when, when it was being developed. And now I think as a community we, we should tease it apart so we do have the choices for a better reporting engine, um, better chargeback capabilities, uh, maybe a standard message bus rather than the homegrown queue uh, that we've developed based on the, on the database. Uh, maybe the policy engine that we have is you know it's good but maybe there's better ones that we can the automation engine, the workflow engine, same thing. I kind of think ours is pretty cool, but uh, maybe maybe there's a you know a better one out there. Uh, and you know the automated roadmap. Madhu is going to give that talk I think tomorrow, right, Madhu? Wherever you are. Yeah. <coughs> Another challenge is how do we manage new things, right? Um, I think John Mark uh, mentioned. Containers, you know, in the other room there. How do we manage those things? I mean, there's, there's no place in the UI to put them. There's no place in the database to put them. There's kind of no place anywhere to put these things yet because they're a brand new entity. Um, you know, so what we've traditionally done is we've um, we've kind of you know examined the problem domain and and then started abstracting from that problem domain into what tables do we need in the database? What, what Will they interconnect with, and, a store, and, a, and kind of drives this whole monolithic approach? I, I think we we have to start figuring out a way to move away from that to have kind of uh, management domains or management entities that we can just plug into the product, um, so that Manage IQ is just a framework for managing things, not as it is today, you know, a, a cloud management. The framework that's limited to uh, the cloud and nothing else. Um, same thing with software defined networking. Where do we put that? Um, bare metal. A lot of people are, are asking for support that, you know, if we're going to manage the data center, um, you know, managing the virtual infrastructure and cloud is just two pieces of it, or, or a few pieces of it. We have to manage the bare metal that a lot of shops are running. Um, 
where they're running their systems, that they're not planning to move to cloud or virtual or anything. Uh, how do we deal with content on systems? You know, how do we deal with config management? Um, Chef Puppet seemed to be pretty good answers. How do we integrate them? We don't know. Um, there's going to be a talk, uh, I think today, on integration with Foreman. Um, so I think that will touch on the last two pieces on bare metal and on content. <clears throat> so where, where do we go with all this? Like, these are like challenges for us, and we have to start solving them, you know, as a community. Um, and I think we have to come up with kind of some basic frameworks for how it's all going to work, you know, be laid out. So one proposal that I have here is to start separating things out a little bit cleaner um, than we have been in the past. So the idea here is that the product will have a base um, that has kind of basic things in it, um, scalability, database, um, message bus workers, all that kind of stuff that's in the base. Um, things like authentication, authorization, RBAC, um, tagging, all, all these kind of basic functionality should live in the base. And when I say base, that might mean in the future a, a separate repo, you know, manage a cube base repo or something like that. Um, and the base should also have a REST API that just comes along with it. Uh, then I think there kind of should be basic services that plug in to the system um, that are over here. Um, these are not <laughs> things that we manage, these are kind of capabilities, these are services that the system offers. And if we can figure out some uh, a framework for plugging each of those in in a clean way, um, with clear separation and delineation, I think that will, that will help us to evolve to a place where we can start plugging things into, into the system. Um, and here are the things that we're actually managing, the types of things, cloud, virtual infrastructure, containers, storage, you know, network, all these kinds of things. Like what, what problems are we solving? What, what things are we managing? So, so these are the services. So you have the base, the services, and the management types, domains, whatever you want to call them, that, that people are, want to manage. Um, and <clears throat> the system should expose kind of an abstraction for each of those types, but not the implementation for any of those types. Finally, um, the UI should be built on top of the REST API, because I really think there should be a, a contract that says that whatever you see being done in the UI, you can do through the uh, API as well. It's really that simple. Does anyone have anything to this picture? I think the next slide really. Why don't you do the other one? Um, so focusing on the bottom right there, the management types, um, really we've been calling it internally a pluggable architecture, and that's what we want. Um, we want to take what we have now and completely split it out, ho hopefully into entire repos. Um, and I, at that point, the real goal of this is to enable the community to start adding more. Um, if somebody needs Azure support, we don't have it yet, they can start writing a plugin day one, hooking into the same interfaces that we hook into with the rest of the plugins. Uh, and um, ideally, get this to a point where we can expand it um, quickly um, and uh, consistently across the board. Um, in addition, we want to be able to start adding these other types like container storage uh, content. And I think it falls in the same bucket of being able to create this pluggable system. Um, so I think the challenge for us uh, going forward is how do we do that? Um, like I said, Greg's going to be talking about uh, the cloud virtual part with the existing code. Uh, but I think we're going to have to start thinking about um, doing it with the other pieces as well, the containers and the storage. And I think as we start going through those, we're going to come up with a consistent kind of API interface uh, for all of these different types of things. Um, yeah, that's really it. I, I, I would even char characterize it as one step further. Um, I think there's going to be two levels of pluggability. There's going to be a provider that you plug into, say, cloud or into virtual or into container. And someone's going to go off, or some team's going to go off and implement that provider. Um, there's also going to be new problem domains for which one of 
these boxes has to be a cradle. Like for example, the containers box doesn't exist at all today. It's not that we don't have Docker. We don't have the containers box to which you can plug in Docker, right? So you really need kind of each of these boxes on the right. Those are really the um, the pluggable providers. But I think you also need each of these boxes here that, that are the actual plugs that the system exposes um, for each of the management entities that we want to we want Manager Cubit to deal with. Um, I think the thing on the left is a little bit more complex because you kind of have to abstract a lot more of things that you don't necessarily know. Um, so the, the, that's the challenge. It's kind of a two-fold abstraction that we're going to have to have. Yeah, I think one more thing that I want to mention here is that the other thing we're trying to do is kind of create commu communities around outside of Manage IQ itself and try to kind of make it a little bit bigger than it is now. Um, so I can see communities coming up around Chef and Puppet or Microsoft SCDMM that may not even involve core Manage IQ. It may just be an entire community of Microsoft enthusiasts who, who like, a, like the product and want to make that the best of breed Microsoft SCDMM handler. Um, and I think that's a real cool way to get this, to get the product um, a wider audience and get it more adopted across the board and make it the de facto cloud manager. The other, the other thing that I wanted to mention on the screen is that, you know, if the end goal is that a lot of these things are separate repos, um, then we can actually start thinking about composing new products, like brand new products that never existed before. Because right now, there's a Manager Q product that manages everything. But suppose some, some company wants to just take this open source um, technology that's out there and make, I don't know, a, a container management product that only does container management and nothing else. I think if we start splitting things out, then people can actually focus on that and making a smaller, tighter product um, that's focused on a different thing. And I think just splitting it out this way will we'll, um, start creating opportunities that we currently aren't even seeing. <clears throat> Then we'll get more into it, but um, the UI framework, I think, has to have a similar notion to, to what we have in the kind of the base product. Um, as I said before, it has to be built on the REST API. That's kind of a must. Um, it has to be, you know, it has to have base capabilities. You know, it has to have authentication and authorization and internationalization. Um, it has to have a bunch of primitives in, in the system to create a tab or to create a drop down or to create something. Um, and all these things kind of have to exist in the base. And then on top of that, and maybe the, these boxes on top will eventually become their own um, repos as well. Maybe the, the cloud tab should just be a cloud tab <coughs> project that just focused on, on the cloud, or, or maybe it's just part of a, a bigger UI thing. You know, so that if and if Booz Allen or somebody wants to come in and want to create a, a self-service portal tab or something like that, they can just go off and create it, right? It's not something that, and it could be integrated easily with the Manage IQ technology and then put together, as I said before, in a completely new way that, that we are not seeing yet today. But I think right now a lot of people are going off and writing their own thing instead of figuring out how to kind of make it all work together. Um, so just a little bit of uh, an overview of the uh, current directory structure on um, <coughs> on the project, on the Manager Q project. So today we have really the major repo that, are, that most people work from is the Manage IQ repo on GitHub. Um, and under it you'll find five directories. Um, there's a build directory, a host, lib, system, and VMDB. Um, So some of these directories are, there's different reasons for each of the kind of subdirectories that are there. And I really want to kind of paint a vision of what I want to see going forward here. Um, so the build directory has the community build files. It's high to the code base, fairly independently. I think we have to figure out a way to kind of have a manage a queue build repo and kind of move it out somewhere, or manage a queue appliance repo, whatever it's going to be, and just move those bits out because they have nothing to do with the day-to-day -day things that people are working with. <coughs> There's a host directory which um, 
how does the management use smart proxy? It's really, for the most part, um, it's being used to run PowerShell scripts on Windows systems. Um, but pretty uh, recently, because of our uh, Microsoft SCVMM work, uh, we've come up with an alternate solution that uses the WinRM gem, uh, that just basically lets you remote um, PowerShell execution on uh, Windows boxes if you give them enough credentials and you know that kind of stuff. So I really think that once um, that alternative solution is in place, we should just remove this directory. I don't think it should exist anymore. As you mentioned that there was a talk.manageiq.org post about how to run PowerShell scripts through uh, automate uh, with the WinRM gem that's been played around and tested with and it seems to be working well. So given that we have that, there's really no reason for the smart proxy anymore. The next directory is the lib directory. The lib directory was really created as um, mostly standalone libraries that are there that were never gemified um, because we had no need to do it, you know, as a as a proprietary standalone company. Um, but now, as an open source community, I really think that we that all these things should just leave, you know, exit into their own gems. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of each one, but that's the general kind of idea. I think pretty recently we um, took the over code um, and put that into its own gem. So all of our interface to over now is, is in a separate GitHub repo. Um, and now you know there's a now there's questions of should we use that one or should we use another one, which is a great question, and we should analyze it and decide which one we, we want to use, whether that's the right thing to use. Um, Rich will be giving a talk on uh, the M analysis <coughs> leasing kind of library uh, tomorrow, um, and there's a bunch of directories there, and I'm kind of hoping that you know the end result is that you know there will be a manager few fleecing gem out there or something or something that maybe you give it the uh, the I/O stream or the storage path or whatever the, the bits are, and it kind of makes things happen. Really be cool. So the idea of the lib directory is that. It all vanishes as well. Um, then there's a system directory, which is really um, a bunch of files that get laid down with the creation of the manager queue client. Um, so those are not really, uh, so I think the EVM watchdog is there, and the, I think the EVM server D is there, the thing that starts uh, the, uh, the process on, on the appliance and kind of makes it live, you know, Makes it happen there. The default comp files, Apache comp, HTTP, D comp. Now, all the uh, things that really have to do with the appliance, right? Not really having anything to do with a developer running this thing anywhere. Um, it's, it's sort of related to the build, which you can see there. But the build is more about building the appliance, and this is like the guts of the appliance. So the last question is, you know, should the build and the system directories be moved out to a brand new repo? Together, a separate man, maybe manage a few appliance or something. You know, is there a way we can make that happen? Um, finally, there's the uh, VMDB directory under there, and the VMDB directory is really the Rails application that's pretty standard if you were a Rails developer. You know, so uh, a Ruby on Rails developer takes one, of, takes our repo, the manage a queue repo. Um, then they do like. They get it, then they do CD, VMDB, and then from there they run their Rails uh, application. It's kind of really screwy. Um, so I think the goal is to get rid of the build, the host, the lib, and the system. We've got to get rid of all of those directories out. And a manager queue repo should just be the Rails application without a VMDB directory. It should just be the application. Um, I think this will make it easier for Rails developers to get started. Uh, because right now it's a little bit of a, of a challenge. Um, I think it will also make it easier for Rails tools um, that we've been trying to interface with to work in a pretty standard way. I kind of Jason recently did something on Travis, right, to, to kind of make things more standard. Yeah, so Travis is, a, there's certain expectations that a lot of these tools have that the um, Rails, uh, the Rails code will be in the root of whatever repo it has, and stuff just works. And because we don't have that, stuff doesn't work. Um, I tried to integrate, I did Travis, Travis I was able to get working, um, but I want to use uh, a, uh, a website out there called Gymnasium, 
that uh, looks at the gems in your application and tells you when they go out of date. Uh, and also, let if, if you give it uh, the permissions to, it'll actually let you know when you have security problems as well. So if a security uh, problem is introduced in a gem, you can know right away. We literally can't use that at all because it doesn't know how to change directories. So it looks for a gem file at the root of the, at the, root of the project and says, nope, there's nothing there, and so we can't use it. Um, and it, these kind of blockades that are really annoying to Rails developers, including us. Um, so that's one of the big pushes for this. Yeah, yeah and you know, in general, I think we should probably get to, um, once we have this, uh, a single directory, or uh, it, you know, getting rid of, VM, of all the other directories and just having VMDB that will get deleted, uh, I think we should figure out a way to kind of make ManageIQ run on the latest Ruby and the latest Rails, and that shouldn't be kind of an issue. So that we can, because today we're kind of running on an outdated Ruby and an outdated Rails, and it's not good for um, getting new community members involved, but even more so, um, we're missing opportunity because of that. You know, for example, in uh, the Ruby 2.x world that I think uh, Joe is going to be presenting um, tomorrow, I think, um, there's major improvements to memory management going on. So what that means for our project is if we can use the newer Ruby, we will have a more performance system that uses less memory, right? So ju just, by, just by moving to a new Ruby, we're going to get a performance benefit out of, our, out of the technology. And that's a, it extends even deeper, because that means less memory means you possibly fit more workers on an appliance. More workers on an appliance means less appliances that you need in a scale out. Um, so it, like, these things ripple out uh, into the deployments and, and, and yep. other things. Similar, similarly, um, we're behind on Rails. We're on Rails 3.2. Um, I think, Aaron, what are we at now? Rails 4.2 or something? Or 4.1? 4.2. 4.2. Um, Aaron's going to be giving a presentation on, on the challenges of getting us to Rails 4.x. Um, I know there's been kind of a lot of improvements in the database access, you know, in Rails 4. We're not getting those benefits. We're, we're, not, we're not seeing any of that because we're using the old Rails. Right? I'm sure there's many improvements in lots of areas, but we can't see any of that because we're kind of behind. So I, I think we really have to kind of re-architect here a little bit um, and move up to have the technology run on the latest levels of things that are out there. Yeah, but one thing to add with the Rails 4 stuff is we're actually carrying our own patches to yeah. Rails itself. Um, and the longer we carry the patches, the harder it is to move forward because the code just keeps moving on Rails. But our stuff's staying still and it's not going anywhere. We need to get that ahead. Um, so some of the goals there is to try to get, get the code out, get it upstream, you know, get it out into the community. Um, you know, like, like, like I said, Aaron's going to talk about that. Um, same with Ruby. We're on, uh, we don't have a patched Ruby, luckily. Uh, but we are on Ruby 193. That's going out. Uh, it stops uh, support. And it's out already? Oh, oh I, I didn't realize that. I thought it was out in February. Uh, I guess not. Uh, so we're already behind. We've got to get there. And there's, there's other implications of being behind. There's security implications of being behind. Um, with all these um, projects that are out there, you know, as people find security holes in them, they get patched, but they, they get patched on versions that are supported by those projects. If we're running on things that are not supported any longer, that means that we're going to have to fork those things and make patches ourselves um, if we have security issues. So we can't kind of, we really have to start living a little bit closer to the edge than where we have been. All right, and uh, that's all I have for, that's all we have for the uh, business side. Any questions or comments or discussion items? No questions. Uh, Aaron, you mentioned that you're going to be presenting seems that each content type or will have its own types of providers. Types of plugs, right? right. Yeah. So do you see the plugability of providers being specific to content types, possibly? Yes. Given that we have different types? Yes. yes, I'm saying for each for each type of thing that we manage, cloud, storage, network, virtual info, content, whatever, um, I think the plugs are going to have, the API is going to have to be different for each one of those. But, that the provider, that the author, uh, provider author, 
would have to write through a slightly different through a different API because they're different things that you're, you're dealing with. Yeah, so to create something completely brand new, you're going to have to create both the, the socket and the plug, right. the first plug, if you will. And creating once you have that kind of layer, I think creating the plug is not so tough. It's creating that socket that's kind of tough and extending the base functionality. And that's really kind of where we want to focus on that end, is to make that simpler. Now, obviously, this isn't going to happen overnight, so this is a vision. Um, but we have a lot of experience already with the cloud and the bird, so we're going to really focus on that first to see if we can get that right. And what we learn from that, hopefully we can extrapolate out into the other types of sockets that we want to create. I think um, one of the challenges with doing that is if you think about infrastructure providers and cloud providers, sometimes that infrastructure provider is also providing that cloud. Mm -hmm. So you have to be able to link things between those. Mm -hmm. and say this host on this infrastructure provider mm -hmm. is giving you access to this instance on this cloud provider. Yep. If that host goes down, you know this VM is dead. Mm -hmm. Maybe you need to do some kind of rebalancing or something. Yeah. There's policies so like, and stuff. Like he was saying earlier in the, in the intro with the vertices and edges, the edges are pretty key, right? The connections between things are key, and I think that's really important. Um, you'll hear about it in the Foreman discussion. We, Foreman does multiple things, right? It does bare metal provisioning, and it also helps kind of create a layer over content uh, uh, configuration management, so like Puppet and Chef and things like that. Those, to me, I actually see those as two separate things um, with two separate sockets, but they're both going to be Foreman plugins, if you will. And that's, that's going to have a heavy interaction between the two. So, um, yeah, kind of enabling that. Well, having said that, it's a more general problem, right? Because now that you have this extreme plugability, mm -hmm. right, you have things that can be there in different combinations. Right. Mm -hmm. So now the federation of that data, you need something external to everything or external to parts that would say, this is how you federate A to B. Mm -hmm. And all the different combinations you made, you know, this is how you federate um, infrastructure to cloud. Mm -hmm. This is how you federate store, like what we kind storage, of out, storage, storage to, to infra. To infra right? So it's, it's, it has to be kind of external from either thing that you're federating. Right. So it's, it's almost like another layer of plugability. Yep. Like plug this in, and then these are all the things you need to tie it together. Plug this in. Here's how you provide. So I'm see, I'm picturing it more like here's how a plugin would provide its inventory. We create an inventory that actually write to. But then there's also going to be have, going to have to be a sort of a read interface. Like, can I get information about the storage? Let me know about the storages, and maybe I can add a little more info to that uh, during the inventory. Um, or vice versa, the storage may need to know the existing inventory and create links to that somehow. Um, so that's something we're going to have to figure out. Well, well, you would need something that is knowledgeable of inventory and storage. Right. And then say, okay, this is how they go together. Right. Right. I, I almost think of OpenStack as being at that layer not the lower layer. Because if you look at the, like, the definition of OpenStack, I'm picking that one in particular, but I, I feel like this across many of them. OpenStack is taking many open source components and wiring them together, which I think all of them are. Yep. And so if we define OpenStack and say, well, this is providing these kinds of, uh, these kind of sub components, OpenStack itself is the combination of these together. Mm -hmm. And so I've kind of, yeah, I feel like OpenStack, we, we think of it as the lower layer. I almost think of it as this federation layer you're talking about. A service federation. A service, service federation layer. And the services themselves are starting, stopping right. at the VM. All you mean the architecture itself of OpenStack, kind of the, 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 yeah, the, yeah. the, way, the way it's strung together. Right? The way, yeah, because that's the definition, well, in my mind, the, the definition of OpenStack is we're stringing a lot of these different service components, together. services together. And so we could um, not just think of OpenStack as all of them. <laughs> Right. Um, and then with Foreman, it's kind of a little tricky, is Foreman is configuration management inside of OpenStack. So you get this general federation that you're talking about, which is these different services, and now you get something else you want to do that's kind of injecting itself in the middle of something that somebody else is providing. And that's kind of a, like a hybrid federation, which uh, is tricky. Yeah. Uh, speaking of OpenStack, uh, with Manage I2, is this a way to create different users and for different users have a different scope into the resources? Different users inside Manage IQ? Yes. 
Oh, <coughs> then you can manage it. Oh, okay. yeah. So the role-based access control that we, we keep mentioning, um, that's actually tied into, you can tie it into an external service or you can use the internal service. Mm -hmm. um, getting to services, this is something that, one of the services that the core provides. Um, it can access LDAP uh, or free IPA, um, set up the users and groups, and then you can apply, uh, you can carve out different parts that those users and, or groups can see. Uh, and that kind of goes through the whole system, the reporting engine and the, um, and the UI. So you kind of give, uh, you give to manage a queue the highest um, level kind of user that you can, an admin if, you, if possible, to manage a queue. <coughs> and then manage a queue delegates that out into, you know, you want a user that just sees, that just can do X, Y, and Z, can only see these two tabs, people do it all the time. Also different, like for example, this user can only access this open stack and this yep. AWS yes. account, but so, nothing else. So one of the yes. big features that was mentioned in the core service was tagging. Um, and tagging can actually be applied manually, or you can actually apply it automatically as well. If you detect a workload, say I, say I fleece a VM, I see the content, I see it's a SQL Server VM, I want to apply the database tag, and I want to say only my uh, DBAs, this group of users called DBAs can only see things tag database. Um, totally doable. Mm -hmm. Can you take it one level up and uh, divide it into the domains, like uh, OpenStack, uh, EC? You can make a group. Uh, like in order to, for example, have a service provider to provide manage IQ to their customers, and the customers only can see the subset that belongs to them. Absolutely. You can yep. do it to that. Yeah, it's being done now. Zab, are those the types of things that are answered in some of the sessions in the other room? Kind of how you subdivide, manage IQ so that you know different users can see different parts of things and no, how you kind I of mean that's part of no, I mean because this is I mean pretty self driven in the product to them, there are guys who do that, so I think the role based model and how to implement that. I mean that's one level um, down from what we're explaining. Okay. So I mean you should be able to find those answers in the guide and if you don't we can just do something. No, no, that, that's great. I, I don't plan to derail what to do, guys. No, no, we're not. This is just a meant for question and answer. Uh, quick question, kind of more high level. Yeah. Um, I know there's lots of different areas for these discussions. Uh -huh. There's the IRC channel talk, mm -hmm. and um, you know, GitHub issues <coughs> and comments and pull requests. And this, and this conference, hopefully, it's going to be repeated. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this conference, right? So yes. you you listed a ton of questions, right, on what and what will be answered, right? How we and how as a community are we going to answer those questions? Um, so I guess I'll talk about the communication that we have now, where we kind of see things belong. If you will. Okay. Um, I think people are just going to do what they do, so it's, it's hard. To that. Um, right now we have the IRC channel, um, which I I picture as more like real time communication. You know, like you have a problem right now and you just need a quick answer. Um, but, but, even, but, but even that, I really advise people not. Yeah. I really advise people to post on talk first. That's where it's gone. Okay. So th that's kind of transient, right? You write it and it's gone, and no one can learn from that experience. So we want to move that more toward talk.manageiq.work, where it's Googleable, people can find it in the future. Um, you know, that's, that's helping, just asking a question is actually helping the community. Um, so I see that's where most of the discussion would happen. When it comes to things like design, um, you know, stuff that's going to happen here, I'm picturing GitHub issues as being a central point for where the design lives. Um, so if you have a new design, maybe you start and talk and kind of get some ideas, and then when you start to flesh it out, create a GitHub issue and link the actual design um, proposal that you have and cross-link the two. So extended communicate. I, I see GitHub issues as more like developer discussion, real low level, kind of like, oh, you got to add this column or it has to be this type. Move it over to talk if you want to expand it into the user community. Users are like, well, that feature doesn't really fit my use case. You know, or I have this use case. Have you guys thought about this? Um, so I'm, I picture talk as being oh, just a wider audience on those discussions. And then ultimately, once you have what you, once you've implemented it, a pull request is where you go and you actually kind of do the hard review, and we tell you it's really terrible. And everybody gets mad. <laughs> Hey Jason, I think there is a couple of good examples on, on talk and cross-posting on GitHub that might be good, like pointing out the, on talk just to let people know about that. I know that uh, I did something on domain, right, that is actually, I think, cross-reference between the two, which is 
a good example of you know how what to do between the two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's also a couple of things done by Dinaman that mm -hmm. I, I think our our uh, Kinan recently brought back something from GitHub to talk and, and mention and cross like that. I mean I think this is this is very helpful to people to understand where they can contribute because contributing is not only GitHub, mm -hmm. it's talk as well, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's that's very, very important to point that out. Yeah. It, it, one's a business discussion. Which developers have to have business discussions, sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, um, the other one's more technical. <laughs> more technical, like dot your eyes, cross your teeth. And it's, it's going to happen in both places, and I don't think it's really a big deal. I mean, you have two places, yeah. and as long as they're cross-linked and you know how to get from one to the other, um, and people are good about making sure that they, here's all the places you can talk about it, go. <laughs> um, and if they want to have a discussion in a certain place, if you start an issue and you say, please have all the discussions in talk, people will people will go there. And if they don't, direct them over there. And I think um, each each kind of little individual issue can kind of manage that, how they like it the best. My advice is make talk your home page, <laughs> yeah, literally, right. because um, you know, it's so cool. And you see what you haven't read, what is new, and you can really quickly go down to, OK, well, you know, is that interesting to me? And it's a filter, and you've got like four topics, and you're like, I don't care, I don't care, I don't care. Oh, this one is you know, close to my heart. Let's, let's go there. Let me dig and let me provide my feedback. I mean, I think it's a really cool interface, and it's very helpful to go there every day. Yeah, one more comment about IRC. Um, IRC by its nature is transient. Um, I know that Jason set up a, um, an archive uh, somewhere on the internet that lets us see the whole history of the IRC channel. Um, but I see kind of a lot of questions on IRC like, I'm having a problem, IRC, can somebody help? I would really, really much prefer if somebody opens an issue on talk first, and then if it's urgent for somebody, then they would just go into IRC and say, can urgent issue, and the link to the, to the talk issue. Mm -hmm. Because then you might get some response. <coughs> not everybody, not all the engineers are at the same time on IRC. The ones that are on might not be able to answer your questions adequately. So it's really not a good framework. And then there's other people you know, in the community, users and other people that can answer your question. But I think talk is a much better forum for those things. So I would use IRC as really kind of a a call for help to something that you've opened in talk to, in it, uh, to begin with. And it's really easy when you're in IRC. Someone asks a question, you're just like, oh, I have the answer. You type it up. Um, maybe that's OK for the one-offs. You know, the, the quick, where do I, what directory is this in? Oh, go to this directory. Done. But if it's starting to get to be a bigger discussion, try to push it to talk. Say, hey, can you create a topic on talk so we can, you know, keep this forever? <laughs> well, unless so other not, people can learn from this. And that's not the only issue with IRC. IRC is one big monolithic thing that goes on, right? So if three users in the community are having the same, having three different problems on the same day, and they all start posting and cross-posting, I don't know, anyone that kind of enters up thing a little bit later has no idea what's going on. It's like so much to read to catch up, it's, it's funny about it. And so people just, people always seek the kind of the easy way out. So, and, you know, I would say typically, when it gets messy and complicated and I see people just, step back and say, well, I'll wait for it to kind of clarify before I'm going to offer any help. Um, so IRC, I think, is really meant for, um, not for solving problems, but for just for asking for help, pointing at something else where you can't get an answer. Uh, could you talk about the storage domain? Because it seems to me that you've addressed NetApp a little bit. But I mean, at this point now, the discussions are around Viper, vSAN, Swift, and Ceph. Yeah, uh, we have to start uh, thinking of uh, as a community how to start supporting all the different uh, storages that are out there. What makes sense to support? Uh, what doesn't make sense? I know there's folks from Hitachi here; they have storage solutions. So there's, there's kind of lots of different you know uh, things to kind of uh, resolve in the storage domain. We have a solution for NetApp, and it, it's the first one that we have. It's been around for a while, but doesn't really get uh, leveraged as much as I like. Um, I think going forward we should start expanding that. So we, I think we, you know, dipped our toe in the water there on the storage side. And Rich is the, probably the, the the guy that you know he runs the the, the storage side um, of the of Manage IQ. So he, he probably knows more about it than I possibly could. You have to distinguish between software abstractions added on top of physical storage. Mm -hmm. Currently, that app is a physical storage. Thing. 
whereas Swift and Seth would be laid on top of that. You know, the back-end storage could be very well be based no. on that. Mm -hmm. uh, going back to the Federation, if we knew about Swift and Seth and the data was available, how it was wired to the back-end, we could actually have an association path from the physical disk on, you know, the next server, and then a file of the whole disk to the VM or, you know, and then have that whole path, and if anything breaks in that path, you know, you know, which VMs will be affected or vice versa. If something happens, if this VM is running hot, you know, it may impact, uh, you know, the back end. Uh, yeah, and, and as, as we always do, we take it a step further. It's not just knowing, it's reacting, using the yeah, event, we'll, we'll the event we'll cycle to auto-move, you know, workload. Yeah, so yeah, we'll everything's about getting the information and then reacting and then auto -move. Yeah, try the inside control automate that I laid out in the other. We kind of use that model for everything that we start supporting. But the first thing you do is just to provide insight into the thing that you're trying to manage. Um, get as much insight as you possibly can. And then you start figuring out, okay, so now how can I solve problems with this? Um, and there's many, you know, tons of questions about what kind of problems you want to solve. Any other questions? When you guys talk about network, there's a couple of components of networks within it's in each individual cloud provider, mm -hmm. and then there is a network between. Of the back end, yeah. The between physical. of different, yeah. No, well, the physical is, yes, the back end physical, so then you have between VMs, to make sure, and then you have network that possibly can connect different clouds, right? <coughs> give you access to the storage, for example, in. Amazon mm -hmm. from your private cloud. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the single network component would be so in both so you envision that within the cloud management that you will have a network and then you will be network outside? I understand that you didn't get to conceptualize the network. Yeah, yeah. So this yeah. is a very conceptual kind of layout here. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think we've done enough research to even start coming up with an answer to that question. Would be yeah, absolutely. Discussion. So if somebody, you know, somebody has a desire to kind of dig into the network side of things and come up with <clears throat> a real design proposal around what the, you know, what, what the sockets should look like for for network, and you know, to your point, should there be a separate uh, network component inside cloud, inside virtual <coughs> inside storage, kind of all these things, um, I welcome it. Yeah, we've, we've drawn pluggability, we've visualized pluggability as a one to one. Um, but it may not be that way. We don't really know. Um, but as you know, a single plug may have to fit the two sockets. You know, you may have the network portion. Amazon may provide their whole cloud infrastructure, and then they have their network piece as well, um, or something like that. Um, that's where the research comes in. We got to figure out. A lot of times when we're creating a brand new socket, like when we did cloud, we looked at more than one and tried to see kind of how they match, what what didn't fit. You know, how can we uh, create that single pane of glass across them? I think that's significant. Is um, it's hard to abstract something if you only have one thing to plug in. Yeah, exactly. yeah the, more, the more you have, the better the chance of abstraction. It's right. easy, but it's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Probably wrong. Probably. Well, I mean, that happened with VMware for us, right? What we have now the is yeah, <laughs> VMware is like how everything is written. If you actually look at the code, and then we try to squeeze everything into VMware's bucket, and that really doesn't make sense in a lot of cases. Yeah, so we have to, uh, that's how the whole cloud kind of separation came about is we tried to fit cloud in a VMware bucket. And as we did it, we realized these things are completely different. <laughs> They're not even the same. And that was a bad mistake. So we had to tease it all apart. Um, we're going to make those mistakes, I'm sure. But um, you know, hopefully, as a community, we can see them sooner. Yeah, the other thing is that I think kind of the development model that we've had so far is to be um, agile and try things out. And you know. Software is something that can always be improved and changed without any kind of um, real breakage. Like, you know, if, if you put a building up and then you decide that you need to redo the basement, it's an issue. Um, with software, it's less of an issue because it's, it's, it's all virtual, right? All, all the things inside are really building blocks. So um, I'm of the opinion that it's better to get something um, kind of working to, to solve the, the, the problems that you have. And then when new problems come about, to step back and and see if you can redo it in a better way. You know, uh, you, you can only solve the problem at hand with the information that you have at the time. 
you know, no more. Um, over time, you'll have more information, and so you'll solve the problem in a better way, in a more elegant way, hopefully. Um, but that's kind of that's the nature of software, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, so there is no ideal way. To there is no ideal. Way. There's, there's no perfection or anything. Yeah. <clears throat> Any other questions, comments? Um, when you were talking about the benefits and the strides we need to make to come up to the current versions of Ruby and Ruby on Rails, um, and the reasons why it's hard for us to get there now, uh, once we go through that effort and get to the current versions, are there practices and methodologies we could kind of impose to ensure that when we have to go to the new, next new version, it, it won't be as difficult? I'm not going to leave that to, to Aaron, actually. It's all you. <laughs> you know, I'll talk about it tomorrow. How's that? <laughs> I mean, to oh be fair, yeah, we have upgraded a number of times. Yeah, yeah we started like this project on Ruby 1.8, I think. 1.8. Yeah. We're running Rails 1, 2, something or other. So it's been... We've upgraded to Rails 2, and then to something else, and then Rails 3, and then Rails 3, 2. So we've gone through this process a few times, and we've tried to apply certain practices, but um, we could always do better. Use public APIs. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I'm just here to tell you there's coffee. So oh, get free. So we're going to take a break now until uh, 30. I don't know if you guys. No, perfect. Yeah, we we're just wrapping up. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, there's any other questions in the room? If not, thank you very much. <laughs>